Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Teleshadowing. We are live on YouTube. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat box as we go along and they'll be addressed. I'd like to request Dr. Chima to introduce Dr. Green. Thank you. Very good morning, everyone. It's a great honor to introduce my mentor for almost 15 years. I learned under Dr. Green's mentorship that helped me to polish my clinical skills, and I'm still learning every day. It is said that mentors make our lives easier, and I second that after learning un under Dr. Green's mentorship. I would like to share that we started this teleshutting program about two years ago, and Dr. Green was our first mentor who volunteered his time. And this is third year that Dr. Green is taking his precious time to mentor us, and I really appreciate. Dr. John Green received his medical degree from University of South Florida, College of Medicine, Tampa, Florida. He completed his internal medicine residency and infectious disease fellowship at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. He's a professor of medicine, and currently the Section Chief Division of Infectious Disease and Tropical Medicine and Senior Member of the Internal Medicine Department at Moffitt Cancer Center. He's a Chief Epidemiologist as well. He's a Director of Employee Health. He's a Professor at the De Department of Oncologic Sciences at Moffitt Cancer Center, University of South Florida. Dr. Green is affiliated with numerous committees, community outreach projects, associations, and boards. Dr. Green is an accomplished speaker and writer having published over 230 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals and published over 153 abstracts and has been a speaker over 176 invited presentations. Dr. Green, is, Dr. Green has written and published two books and written over 31 chapters in other books as well. Dr. Green's research interest is prevention and management of infectious complications in neutropenic patients with a hematologic malignancy. In addition, Dr. Green has an interest in the diagnosis and management of pulmonary non-tuberculosis myobacterial infections. Dr. Green earned multiple awards, and a few of those awards include Outstanding Resident Teaching Award by the University of South Florida. He's also received the Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award by the American College of Physicians. He has also been selected by peers as one of the best doctors in the United States. Dr. Green has been mentor to hundreds of, to hundreds of medical students throughout his career and has taken many students with him on his yearly medical mission trips to third world countries. Now I would like to request Dr. Green to please begin today's session so we all can learn. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you, appreciate you all having me again. Thank you, Asima. We um, always appreciate the honor of doing this and I always look forward to sharing uh, my experience um, with you. So um, I'm going to share with you um, my screen and I hope it works out for us and I'll give you a little history on myself and also focus on the world of infectious disease and what would constitute an emergency in the world of infectious disease and try to give you some syndromic patterns of recognizing infection so you could see what this kind of medical job is all about. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can, Dr. Green. Great. And then um, I'm going to advance it. And the, is it still working fine, the next screen? Yes. Yes, it so, is. So um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up in the Miami area, which is what you're looking at, both in the South and the North, and spent uh, most of my time uh, enjoying the amenities nearby, which includes the beaches and also um, the Biscayne Bay area and the Everglades. So I've always been around water and have enjoyed that. And I did my high school in uh, Haile Miami Lakes and played football and um, wound up at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia on a football scholarship and my pre-med was underway for four years. When I finished there, it was the um, interesting historical things about the second oldest college in the United States with Harvard number one and Thomas Jefferson attended. And that was um, a nice uh, semi-rural area in a small town of Williamsburg that looked like that. Then I joined the University of South Florida and worked at the Moffitt Cancer Center, where I have been for over 31 years. And that's where I spend my 
<clears throat> career on the fourth floor taking care of leukemia patients. The medical school has moved downtown away from our Moffitt USF campus 20 minutes away. Uh, so I miss seeing them in person and Tampa General nearby also um, worked over there. And the Moffitt continues to grow and we're still growing even today with new buildings and new expansions doing a lot of research. Just to give you a timeline of how um, the medical career looks like, after four years of college, uh, most people go right into med school if they're fortunate enough to be admitted right away. Some people spend an extra year beefing up their application. And then in med school, the first two years are learning uh, the basics in the classroom. That includes anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry, and all the science classes you may have had some experience with, and a little bit of clinical. And then finally, the third and fourth years, you get to spend uh, learning the clinical, and now you uh, feel like I'm actually learning the stuff I'm going to use and every, on a daily basis with the background that we've already had. Then we apply to residency, and I did three years of internal medicine residency. <clears throat> Some people do five years of uh, surgery. And then, then I decided to do fellowship infectious for two years. So I was 31 years old when I finished all of that training and then joined um, as a assistant professor of medicine at the University of South Florida in 1991. So it was a uh, long journey to get to that point, but it was well worth it. And um, we work with and train uh, sort of like a military kind of hierarchy where you have um, after graduating um, college and getting into med school, you're the medical student, so you're on the lowest tier of the authority structure. And then we go to the intern the first year out, then the resident who's uh, anywhere from two to seven years in training. Then they have the specialist, the fellow, which is an extra two years of training. And then finally, you're called an attending where you are ready to practice medicine. So uh, the mentorship and people overseeing you exists the entire training period, including after you finish your fellowship, you may be an instructor as opposed to jumping straight to an assistant professor and you have oversight. And once you become an assistant professor, you then take five years if you are going on a reasonable track to become an associate professor, and then another five or 10 years to become a full professor, provided you do a lot of research and teaching awards and uh, can uh, keep up with that um, vigorous uh, pace to make it to the final full professorship. And these are some of our fellows that we have trained that uh, come from all over the world all over the United States, and they wind up settling in different parts of the world, many in Florida, many outside, and many in other countries. And now they're trained in infectious diseases. And we have our program, which uh, is trying to lure uh, future fellow applicants to join our group of 11 fellows and um, competing with the other fellowships. Now, part of what I do is also um, a little bit of going to other countries, taking fellows, med students, residents to see what medicine is like in other countries. Fortunately, I've been able to go to Bolivia, <coughs> excuse me, going to La Paz, the highest airport in the world where you can get altitude sickness. And then from there down into the valley of Bolivia in Santa Cruz. And you can see how La Paz is so high up in the Andes and Santa Cruz down in the valley where you don't have that um, altitude sickness. We all uh, get the yellow shirts, go on the trip to the airplane from Miami to Bolivia, direct flight with all of our luggages, suitcase, 
we land at the place we're saying the local missionary and then we set up our places to stay in rooms that have a little ac and then fans and bunk beds and unpack and then the first day we get all the medicines in country and bought them there because it's hard to get through customs and we pack the medicines in little packets that will be dispensed during <clears throat> the four days of medical training with other fellows, other attendings. And this is the pill packing day where we put them in little bags. And the areas that we go to may look like this. And sometimes it's rained and uh, the roads are a little wet. Uh, you can have fun with the local animals sometime. And there's where we do our clinic in a local church area. The people come and we set up shop and we say hello to them, visit them, and have an interpreter if we don't speak Spanish. One of the places uh, we set up, we have six tables and see patients at each one and find out their problems, dispense medications, and even give out eyeglasses to those who need eyeglasses. And we listen intently with an interpreter on what each patient has. And we listen to them all the way down to pediatrics, whoever wants care, and give them their medications if they need it. And even demonstrating how to open your mouth. And um, the girl there is looking a little afraid at his big mouth and tongue there. So um, you have to calm down the children and help demonstrate to them what you're trying to do. Sometimes the indigenous people come in and have their uh, children with them, so you need an interpretation from Spanish to the indigenous Indian language sometime. <clears throat> and then many mothers with their children will come in with their different um, uh, cultures and ways of doing things. Sometimes they have uh, children that have mental capacity needs like cerebral palsy, etc. And there's little you can do but give them assurance and explain what's going on. Uh, and then uh, the children there, like children all over the world, are always fun to be with and happy. And they get their medicine with their name on it so their mother knows what to give each child and keep all that straight. Now, if you go to a hospital, such as this one in Africa, one of the big problems is typhoid fever, which prevent, presents with <clears throat> a burst of the intestine in the small intestine ileum cecum and it drains through fistulas in the abdomen, and sometimes people don't survive these severe infections. However, when you do survive this severe infection, you go to the OR and you see the holes are in their intestine. You cut out the piece of intestine with the hole, sew it back together, and then after several clean-out surgeries, they can live with an otherwise fatal disease, which is a bowel perforation. To give you an example, this girl came to the hospital in Africa, and after 20 days of being sick and septic, she made it in at three years of age, and after multiple surgeries and rehab, she eventually was well enough to leave, and that was her on her discharge six weeks later. So sometimes there'll be life-threatening problems, and you can actually make a big difference in people's lives who otherwise would possibly die without the best of medical care. And um, sometimes you can actually, on the mission field, write an article, as they did, about perforated typhoid. I've never had a case of typhoid, but uh, in the 10 months there, this person had 191 patients that um, required surgery for 112 for perforated typhoid. And despite a high mortality, they were able to have only 16% of patients die, which is a, a amazing save rate for that kind of problem. And they wrote a paper on it. And another paper they wrote uh, describing the same thing on how this is practiced in Africa. Speaking of Africa, one of the places the least amount of physicians in the world is in Africa. And this map shows you 
that that's how many physicians there are in Africa per the population. And that's why the whole continent is so small. And then if you look at other countries in the world, you can see the US and Asia and Europe are very well represented with physicians. And sometimes you can take your whole family and raise your family on the mission field in protected areas as they did in Zambia. Now, to talk about the rest of the world, since Infectsees is also in charge of tropical medicine and knowing what's going on around the world, you get to be a very um, broad uh, thinking epidemiologist and have to know what is going on around the world that could by an airplane flight make it to the United States or someone visiting there bring it back and you might see these rare diseases even in your own um, hospital or uh, medical community. So knowing what's happening in the world is important. And when you learn medicine, you learn what's called syndromic based diagnoses. And what is that? Well, let's break them down into little bite-sized categories. First of all, what are the emergencies of infectious if you are encountering an animal, sometimes a bite or a scratch or a lick? And let's say you don't have a spleen and your spleen is in your left upper abdomen. And it's important to get rid of organisms that have a capsule around it because it makes antibodies. So people without a spleen who get a bite, especially a dog bite, can be very sick. So let's start with that first. Uh, dog bite, most people obviously get better and it, nothing major happens to most people and it heals up and they may or may not need antibiotic. But if you don't have a spleen and it gets the bacteria in the dog's mouth gets into your bloodstream, spreads all over your body, your circulation starts to suffer. You turn with these echematic, purplish looking skin lesions due to poor circulation. Your blood vessels can start to coagulate and clot, <clears throat> excuse me, called DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Your blood culture can grow a thin gram-negative rod and an anaerobic bottle. Your hands and feet can turn black. We call that dry gangrene. And you may actually lose your fingers and toes if you survive the infection. And sometimes it makes your nose black, which may need to be debrided and reconstructed. And it's called capnocytophagia canamorsis. And that sounds like a big <clears throat> word, but if you break it down in its original Latin, capno is CO2, phasia is eat. So it eats CO2. It needs CO2 to grow in the lab. So that makes sense, capnocytophagia. Canamorsis is named after the dog is a canine. And that's how you remember it. So these are highly fatal encounters with dogs and people without a spleen. And this is the dry gangrene a week, three weeks later, if you survive because of the poor circulation to the distal parts of your body. And this is a patient at Moffitt who has what looks very similar to the picture I just showed you, except <clears throat> she did not have a dog bite and she's getting dry gangrene and purple changes to her nose or skin. And she has purpura fulminans. And it's a name of a syndrome that is due to poor circulation. And the two major causes are on the left. Anything that affects your coagulation system can cause it, which is exactly what she had related to her cancer called a mesothelioma. Or in my arena, is the infectious causes of purpura fulminans, which includes the encapsulated bacteria strep pneumonia, Nicerum meningitides, and yes, on the list is capnocytophagia canamorsis. This is um, the diagram of what you're looking at with that blockage of the blood flow to the distal parts of your body. And some of the coagulation system is abnormal, including something called protein C, which you may need to replace. And then when you look at the blood test, especially the platelets, which are involved with clotting, 
they drop dramatically. And then when you recover, they come back to normal, which is the red line. And then during all of this period of time, you get all kinds of uh, bad numbers on your laboratory data. Another cause of <clears throat> purpura fulminans, dry gangrene, is meningitis. And this is what meningitis looks like, such that you are stiff and laid out in this kind of a pattern because your spinal fluid is full of inflammation. So you're totally extended on your spine. You are very comatose and your neck is stiff. And that's a classic sign for meningitis. Here is your brain with meningitis with the pus and dilated blood vessels. And just like that similar rash, you could get this petechial purpuric rash bleeding into the skin, giving you those. And there is the bacteria in the middle of the white cells in the middle and the bacteria on the periphery. And it's called a gram-negative diplococci, diplo meaning two. There's that pattern again showing up. See that? And then the dry gangrene. So what kind of infections do people without a spleen get? Encapsulated bacteria. And I highlighted three of them. There's a few more, including malaria and babesia. And these are medical emergencies. So people without a spleen need to be vaccinated against the top uh, two. And um, also uh, to sometimes take penicillin until they're 21 years of age to prevent this deadly kind of infection. So remember, if, it, if you don't have a spleen, your risk is highest if you inherited it. And if you have trauma and you lost your spleen because it ruptured, that's the lowest risk. But you are 60 times greater than normal to get sepsis. Another animal, what if your kitten or cat bites you like is about to happen to this child? You could get an infection from the cat's mouth, which is called pastorella. And uh, it includes the big cats as well as the small cats. And this is a bad location for a bite because it punctures the tendon sheath. And your tendon um, has fluid in it that goes all the way to your forearm. So this infection can be in your finger, and now it has direct access all the way to your forearm. And uh, this is caused by Pastorella multocida, named after Louis Pasteur, multi multocida, and cida, cida kills, kills many. So it sounds like a bad name for a bacteria, multocida, multi cida. Cat bites are much more common to infect you than a dog bite because a cat punctures you deeply with the teeth, whereas a dog bite macerates and cuts, but the wound stays open instead of a puncture. If you punch someone in the mouth and you hit their teeth or they bite you, the human mouth is full of iconella and anaerobic strep. And if it punctures your skin, gets into your bone and joint, you can have a septic arthritis as this is showing. Fortunately, all bite wounds are um, treated with the same antibiotics, amoxicillin clavulanate, augmentin. If your lab rat or your pet rat bites you, you can get a certain uh, bacteria found in the rat's mouth. Its name is called Streptobacillus monoliformis. If you don't treat it, you can die of this. And if you're in Asia, it's called Spirillium minor, and a minus, which is a spirochete similar to syphilis. And they may have names for it, such as Sudoku in Asia. Now, this may be flying around your bedroom. And what you're looking at is a bat. And if that bat has come in contact with your skin and possibly bit you, this is your brain with rabies. And in your neuron is a little red circle called a negri body. Highly fatal, of course. There's the neuron with the red negri body of rabies. Besides the bat, we have the raccoon, the skunk, the coyote, and the fox are all major uh, carriers of rabies. In the rest of the world, it's the dog. And then you in the infectious world need to know what animal is what so uh, you can recognize them and what each one might spread. 
As I mentioned, rabies in the rest of the world is mostly from dog bites. Now, all bite wounds and any injury, you have to consider, are they vaccinated every 10 years with tetanus vaccine? If they're not, they can get tetanus from the bite in the wound. And this is called the sardonic smile. He's not smiling to be happy. He has locked jaw. And this is called rhizus sardonicus, the sardonic smile, but they're not smiling. They have locked jaw. And when they have total body spasm in the left upper corner, it's called opisthotness, where every muscle in your body is competing to contract and making you very painful. This is the opposite of tetanus, and this is called botulism. And instead of spasming, you become paralyzed because it knocks out your inhibitory neurons and um, or the neurons that conduct as opposed to tetanus, which knocks out your inhibitory neurons. And this can rarely occur from wounds, but mostly is from, from um, ingesting food. This is a baby called the floppy baby syndrome, totally paralyzed from eating some food with botulism in it. They always say honey is one of the big culprits, but there's many foods that can do it. And then knowing how it happens is important. The, the botulism blocks acetylcholine release from the nerve to stimulate the muscle to contract. And when you block that no muscle contraction, you become paralyzed. And this is the mechanism of the acetylcholine release and how botulism prevents it from happening. And if you give the antitoxin, it binds to the botulinum toxin and prevents it from causing this problem. So you have to do that early on. <clears throat> Other emergencies besides animals, we have water-associated emergencies. So if you get an alligator bite, a leech bite, or a propeller injury in fresh water, or you play mud football, or you go to a mudathlon, <clears throat> you are exposed to fresh water, you can get cuts on your body, and you're going to be at risk for aromonas. And if you have liver disease or iron overload, you can get septic shock with bull-eye, blister formation, and a high mortality. So that's the fresh water bug, aromonas, hydrophila, hydro water, phila loves water. Now, if you like eating raw oysters, which is salt water, or you like fishing and salt water. And again, if you have iron overload and you have liver disease, you drink a lot of alcohol, you might have liver disease. And this bug, which um, we all encounter in salt water, may be deadly in a person who has the right risk factors. And there's that bull eye blistering sepsis turning black, another bad sign, bull eye formation. And that is a curved gram-negative rod. It grows on a special media called thiocitrate bile salt, TCBS. Just like salt water, it needs salt to grow in the lab. And it's called Vibrio vulnificus, the vulgar Vibrio vulnificus. It kills people, 50% mortality with liver disease. And then um, Aramonas we covered, of course. And these sort of got duplicated. I apologize. Somehow, there we got it. Guess what? When there's a hurricane like Katrina in New Orleans, you have salt water flooding the area. You have people waiting in salt water. And guess what? You see an increase in Vibrio vulnificus after hurricanes because of people exposed to the salt water. And it loves the summer months where it's the highest concentration in the water. So in summary, the syndromes to consider dog bites, excuse me, human bites, strep, anaerobes, uh, Iconella, dog bites, DF2, which is capnocytophagia, canamorsis, pastorella, multocida, cat bites, pastorella, saltwater, vibrio, and freshwater aromonas. So that's the syndromic stuff. What about pregnancy emergencies in the world of infectious? So pregnancy is an interesting uh, immunosuppressing condition. Our first bug to worry about is a gram-positive rod. It's found in a refrigerator, especially 
in the ice cream, the soft cheeses, not hard cheese, the cold cuts like salami, bologna. And if you're vegetarian, yes, it's in lettuce, cabbage. It grows in the cold, so we call it cryophilic, cold loving. And it loves to go to your central nervous system and cause meningitis. It loves to go to your pregnant, uh, your fetus and right to the placenta. And that's what you're looking at. The placenta is infected. So is the baby in utero. And there's the granuloma. This grand positive rod is unique because it has beta hemolysis on the uh, left side, if you look at that. Sorry about that in the background. Now, this is one of the grand positive rods, and we call it listeria, okay? And uh, listeria is our main problem that we're talking about. All right. And then it has a propensity to go to your midbrain and form focal abscesses, as you can see there. And um, it likes to go to your cerebellum in your midbrain, and we call that rhombencephalitis, which is a unique syndrome. Other infections can do it, but leading the list is listeria. Here's the baby who unfortunately did not survive, and we call this granulomatous and phantom septicum, which means granulomas everywhere, skin, liver, spleen, brain, heart. So remember, pregnancy, listeria, 70 to 90 percent chance if you eat it, it gets into your blood, it will go through the placenta to the baby, and you may not even be that sick as the mother, or you might have a mild flu-like illness and it could lead to a bad outcome for baby more so than mother. And there's the food at the top that are the classic vehicles. And here's what happens. If you're infected in the first, second trimester, the baby dies 77% fetal loss, premature delivery. If you're infected in third trimester, premature delivery or abnormal delivery. There it is, living listeria within a white cell called a macrophage or monocyte. And there it is, happily living in the cytoplasm. There's the beta hemolysis, giving you that whitish pattern. There's motility on a semi-solid auger. You stab it with the listeria, it migrates outward, and it gives you the umbrella sign. And guess what? It likes the old, which is defined as over 50. It likes the young, defined as less than one year of age. And then in between, it's not as common. So remember, listeria, neonates, the elderly, the pregnant women, the immune suppressed, and the mortality is the second highest with Vibrio vulnificus being one acquired from eating food. And uh, the other groups of people who have listeria are people with transplants, cancers, kidney failure on dialysis, iron overload. That's one of the iron overload bugs. We have a mnemonic called LIVA, L-Y-V-A. What bacteria need uh, iron to grow exogenously? L is listeria, Y is yersinia, V is vibrio, and A is aromonas. So it sounds like liver, because if you have liver disease, iron overload, you can get these LIVA bugs at increased risk. And pregnant women, besides that syndromic bacteria, they're also at higher risk of the flu, hepatitis E, herpes simplex, malaria, um, somewhat increased severe illness, but not more likely to get it, measles, HIV, um, and then varicella, chicken pox, and some fungus infection. Now, keep in mind, in the first semester, trimester, it's not semester, trimester, you are having a drop in your pro-inflammatory immune system so your body doesn't reject the baby. Second trimester into the third, you're very immune suppressed T cell, which listeria takes advantage of because your inflammatory response is reduced so you don't kill and attack the baby. And then after delivery, your immune system goes back to normal and so these changes during that critical period affect the mother and obviously the baby. Now, this is called black water fever because you're peeing black in your urine. And that's because your red cells are breaking apart 
with hemolysis and you turn yellow called jaundice in your eyes. And this is the culprit, malaria, falciparum, plasmodium falciparum, more severe in pregnant women with uh, bad outcomes for fetus potentially. There's the banana-shaped gametocyte on a peripheral blood smear and the circles are your red cells. It's a leading cause of kids in Africa and other countries where they have malaria and it sludges in your brain. Another species makes your kidney not uh, to excrete protein and you lose protein called nephrotic syndrome and you get blown up like this because of low protein. This uh, malaria looks like the planet Saturn. It's called Plasmodium malariae. And there is the, the um, red blood cells on scanning micrograph hemolyzing releasing the malaria, the little yellow circles inside to infect other, um, <clears throat> other red cells. Notice the global malaria deaths are highly represented in Africa, less so in South Asia, and very, very, very less so in Central South America. This is an adult with falciparum malariae. Here's a thick smear to look for the malaria, taking some blood, putting it on a slide. And if you see the ring forms on the left, you know it's malaria. And if you look on a high power field on the right, called a thin smear as opposed to a thick smear, you can see multiple rings in a red cell with a high level of red cells affected. More than 5% is bad. This is like 20% you're likely to die, and that's falciparum malaria, the worst kind. And you can even do antigenic finger sticks, and like a pregnancy test, it will tell you which species it is, if it's vivax or falciparum, or negative. Pregnancy malaria is a big, bad, uh, negative outcome. It's an emergency, and we have to support mother, baby, and it's in endemic countries. Now, the risk of you catching malaria on traveling is highest in Oceania, which is like New Guinea. Next is Africa under the Sahara Desert. Next is India. Next is Southeast Asia. And the least is South America. And then this are, if you come back with a, a fever illness, one of the leading infections, if you're systemically ill, is going to be malaria, especially falciparum and then occasionally typhoid and dengue, and then diarrhea and respiratory are different syndromes. So what should you take when you go travel? Malarone is preferred, followed by doxycycline, followed by uh, mefloquine. Always take DEET spray to keep the mosquitoes off your body. And that is it for my talk. And I hope you found uh, this useful to um, see how infectious disease handles uh, all kinds of patient problems, whether you're a child, an adult, a pregnant lady, whether you've traveled around the world, whether you visit a place around the world, and what you could be at risk of depending on your underlying conditions such as iron overload, liver disease, and immunosuppression. So fun, fun, fun stuff for us to know very deadly uh, for many people, but we can actually make the difference if we know what we're looking for and get treatment started early or even prevent some of this stuff from happening. So I would love to open this up to any questions and turn it back over to Menahil to uh, moderate us. Thank you so much for your mentorship and teaching, Dr. Green. I really appreciate it, and especially the broad spectrum view you provided us from a wide variety of patients and cases and also learning from your career path and journey. It's very inspiring for me as well. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Manahil. I am a rising medical student at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, so I'll be starting my uh, medical journey um, this fall. Um, and to start off our Q&A, we sort of separated our questions based on the clinical um, questions as well as your career path and journey. So to start off with the uh, questions from your clinical cases, um, from Okobi's story, what is the difference between marasmus and kwashiorkor? Um, because I've, I've heard of them separately, but not together. And so her diagnosis was marasmic kwashiorkor. 
Yes, yeah, so it's very hard to tell them apart, um, but the uh, marasmus tends to be more of a protein deficiency, and um, the quasier core tends to be more of a generalized weight loss with generalized loss of um, body fat and poor nutrition, protein, glucose, carbohydrates, et cetera, and uh, muscle mass loss. Um, and to be honest with you, uh, that's something I studied in medical school residency, but since I never see it, I sort of lost my uh, ability to tell you in a very let's say, um, astute way of exactly what is the difference, but that's a great question. And even I would have to look it up to get down to the biochemistry difference of the marasmus versus the quasier core. And um, is it still used today? But the bottom line of the slide was she was obviously uh, heavily dehydrated, malnourished, and unable to eat for three weeks because of this infection and was before that the, not in the best of nutritional support either. Got it. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. I appreciate it. And that was very helpful as I'm preparing for my step one. I, I saw that in my in my chapter about protein energy um, malnutrition. Yes. And so that yes. those were the two, but they were not combined, which is very interesting. Yes, um, yes thank you. Um, and my next question was um, actually about one of your slide regarding um, malaria risk for travelers. And so, you know, one would assume that the risk is should be greater in sub-Saharan Africa than Oceania. Um, but why would the malaria risk for travelers be greater in Oceania than Sub-Saharan Africa and not the Well, um, to be honest with you, most people um, that travel to Tahiti, Bora Bora, and places like that are pretty much heavily um, sprayed against insects, et cetera. But in some of the places that are really rural and um, in the jungle area, Apparently, a lot of that kind of information may have come from many, many years ago with people um, ha having to do jungle warfare, and then how many of their soldiers were actually infected with malaria. And because they were in the deep jungle area, they were more likely to get infected in Oceania. But um, in reality, when you look at most malaria cases, it's usually traveling to sub-Saharan Africa, not going to say, you know, a resort place that you uh, stay along the coast as opposed to a deep trek into the jungle. And um, I would say that that article did have Oceania more higher risk than sub-Saharan Africa, but has that still held true today? And it all depends on where you go in the country, assuming, uh, deep jungle versus staying in a city area may have different risk. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, now switching over to questions regarding your career path and journey. Um, given you wear multiple hats in academia, research, and volunteer work, how do you manage your work-life balance? Well, that's a good point. So um, we are very big into burnout with over overdoing yourself, your plate's too full. They have wellness officers who try to coach us on spending enough time at home, relaxing, spending time with your family, and keeping up with the rigors of um, all the demands on yourself. They've done lots of studies, and they found that how you can prevent burnout um, is, number one, make sure that you're doing tasks that requires your MD, DO degree in such a way that you're utilizing your brain to do these complex uh, decision processes and not doing a lot of the um, documentation in the electronic medical record, asking for um, approval from the insurance company, refilling medications. So if they can give you in your place of employment, a hospital, your office, what's called ancillary staff to help you, such as nursing and um, transcribes. A lot of medical school students for jobs become a scribe to make extra money, and they will actually write the notes, and then the doctor quickly reads it and signs it instead of typing it themselves. 
So if you provide people with support like medical scribes and the nurses um, put in the orders in the computer, which can be quite complex to give them XYZ medication, and all you have to do is review it, sign it, it comes from you, but you didn't actually type it all up, you can save yourself a lot of time. And then, of course, um, doing things that you really love to do, which in my life was traveling, mentoring students. So it takes a week out of your life where you go to another country and show other people what the medical field is like in other countries. And uh, they get a new appreciation when they come back. So you can design your schedule so you can enjoy your life and your career and have family time. And uh, which job you pick may determine how much weekends off you have and family time. So all these decisions are based on what you want to do with your time and what jobs are more demanding than others. So uh, yes, that's very important, even when you're out. Otherwise, you might become unhappy with your job. And I honestly say, I have loved my job and all my training. If I had to do over, I'd do the same thing again. And I just love working with people, teaching, seeing patients and solving mysteries. And I feel like the training of waiting to practice on your own till you're 31 was worth it all. Other people have said, that's too long. I don't want to wait that long, but that's their decision. So your career path can determine what you would like for your future to look like time-wise. Thank you, Dr. Green. And thank you for also touching base a little bit about you know, burnout in medicine and, and how it's really a, a passion that, that takes us through these long and arduous years of training and, and med school and, and, and so on. Um, but speaking of which, and you, you hinted at it a little bit, um, what has been the most rewarding part of your career over the past 30 plus years? So that's a great question. The most rewarding to me is, um, it's sort of like being a teacher, at least in the world of academics. It's like being a teacher for 30 years and you reflect back on your life and you have people like Asima that you've influenced. You have um, people that you poured in, whether it's a month of your time, two years of time intermittently, and then they go on to their own lives, their own careers, and it's really nice to see one of our fellows is an expert in a fungal infection called coccidioidomycosis out in Arizona. And then she writes a lot of publications on it because she's right in the middle of where that kind of fungus is. So that's an example of uh, enjoying your training of somebody and then seeing their career blossom and uh, see them productive. And they sometimes will call you or email you with a tough case and you can still give them counsel and advice. So that's always my most rewarding part, as well as taking people overseas to see different countries and the need out there. And occasionally um, you will find someone was inspired or touched that they spend the rest of their life uh, helping others, whether part-time or full-time in places where you may not be monetarily rewarded, but you would be rewarded just because of the work you're doing, helping a very needy area. So those are my probably favorite moments. Thank you, Dr. Green. It's like, you know, one candle lights another candle, just like you lit my my mom's candle. So my <laughs> fun fact that I, I see as my mom. So, you know, she was my right. mentor. And so um, you know, it, it just goes on through that. So I'm very inspired by you and my mother. Thank you. And by the way, uh, that you reminded me because of the generations, um, we trained an infectious doctor 25 years ago, and then her daughter is now in training for infectious. And so we got to see mother or daughter in the same program, which is really neat. So yes, yes awesome. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Always great to have mentors like you and and any and our parents as well to to be inspired and and move on with medicine. Um, and for our last question, um, what is some advice you have for students who are interested in pursuing research in infectious disease? Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> if it's possible, it gets harder sometimes to shadow people in hospitals because their rules and regulations become 
too complicated and the security of things is getting harder and harder. So if you're fortunate enough to do that, great. It helps you with your application, but doing research also helps your application. And if you can ever find a physician uh, that is willing to um, try to come up with a project that you could do without necessarily having access to the medical records, you can then um, write up a case without knowing who they are and then searching the literature and writing an article about it with the help of your mentor. And so um, those kind of things, or if you work in a lab or you work with some uh, person who's sort of a uh, academic researcher, you then can publish something that you find interesting and uh, will also improve your ability to advance in your medical career. And then if you like a life of research, uh, you might only like it 10% of your life as opposed to 100%. You can find jobs where that is, is possible, where uh, you join an academic program, they expect you to do research, even if it's um, on the clinical side and not in a lab, but they frequently won't pay you to do research, but they expect you to do it on your own time. And so trying to um, um, get protected time to do research is always a challenge as you get higher in your career, but it's good to start in your pre-med life and continue it through your med school life and into your residency and fellowship because it helps you to become a more desirable applicant to, as you go through each interview process and each tier of your training. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. Um, thank you for answering all of our questions. These are all that we have for you today. We really appreciate you taking the time to mentor us. My pleasure. It was great having you, and I wish you success in your career. And it's always great to uh, do this. So thank you for asking me. Thank you. And I love everyone to please give a warm thank you to Dr. Green in the chat box for his incredibly informative session. Thank you again. Thank you. Now we're going to conduct our closing session with our quiz and future session dates. So the link to the quiz for this session is now live. You will need a 70% or higher to pass and receive certification. Um, the link is in the chat box now. Um, now on to our future session dates. Uh, these will also be posted on our social media outlets. So please be sure to follow us at Teleshadowing. And our next live session will be next Saturday, February 25th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with a physician mentoring us in public health policy. Thank you so much to everyone for attending today's session. We hope to see you in upcoming sessions as well. And this concludes this week's shadowing. Thank you. Thank you.